Well, we'll have some time at the end for some other stuff. I want to share a quote, and I apologize. I didn't realize when I, this, you cannot probably read this. It's really the middle paragraph. This was the quote I mentioned to you from Robin DiAngelo. So she's the author of White Fragility, and the main thing it says, the history of extensive and brutal violence perpetuated by whites, slavery, genocide, lynching, whipping, forced sterilization, and medical experimentation, to name a few, is trivialized when we claim we don't feel safe or under attack when in the rare situation, situation of merely talking about race with people of color. So our churches should be safe places. Safe doesn't mean comfortable, okay? So people should never feel threatened or afraid, but we don't have to make sure that everyone's happy every moment. Uh, and, you know, forget race for a moment. Anytime you're trying to work out a conflict, there has to be some discomfort, okay? If you look at how even small groups are formed, healthy small groups go through some kind of time where they're in conflict. Then forget race for a minute again, just personalities, right? And you have to work through that to move on to, to form true community. So when you're having conversations about race, you want people to feel safe, but they're going to have to feel uncomfortable if they're going to really have a real conversation. This is a quote from Martin Luther. And I, I said it this week to my neighbor. You can't cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. I use this all the time at church because we have all kinds of temptations. And, you know, our, our effort as a Christian is to conquer those, right, and to get our habits right, to get our lifestyle right. But as Martin Luther said, you know, these things flip through your head, right, like just thoughts you have. It can be, you know, a billboard that makes you think something sexual that you shouldn't. It can be, you know, some kind of food that, you know, you, you want to eat that you know you shouldn't, whatever. So the same thing is true of racist thinking. I was talking to my neighbor this week, and I was telling her about the talk that I shared earlier. She's someone of very similar experience in, as myself. She literally lives on my street. She's a Christian. Her kids went to the same. She's white. Her kids went to the same schools. Her daughter married a black man. I mean, it's just we have so much in common and such similar experiences. And I was just talking to her about how, you know, even us, well, whatever, still learning, still trying to get it right. And she made the comment, she goes, yeah, I've gotten good at not saying racist things if I could just stop having racist thoughts. And I quoted this to her. Now, as we grow, that does get better, right? We do start to, Christ talks about, the Bible talks about renewing our thinking. But if you can tackle your mouth, then that is wonderful, okay? So I was trying to kind of encourage her not to be so hard on herself because, again, We've been raised in this culture of racism, all of us, and so we all have things that we think that are wrong, and we have to go, oops, no, nope, don't say that. It's just like if you're walking down the street and you see someone you think is really unattractive for whatever reason. They're just, you just think they're ugly, right? And you've learned to not say, man, you are ugly. You know, we've learned not to say that. And you might always think that, or I, I've noticed as I've gotten older, just my standards about everything have grown, right? You know, my expectation, what is beauty? You know, wh what's really important? And learning to value people for who they are, you know, race and other ways. Our culture wants that everything, you know, everybody to be a white, skinny, whatever. You know, we have all these standards, beautiful, certain standards for beauty. Suji talked about that with, you know, plastic surgery, and that's true of obviously of white people as well. People just having it, everything has to be perfect. I saw this piece about, one of the ways you know people from the United States in other countries as tourists is their teeth. Like we're obsessed with our teeth being perfect, you know, white and just perfectly, you know, in our mouths and everything. So there's all kinds of ways that that happens. I want to say that this is when it's harder to be an extrovert. I'm an introvert. I obviously I shared a really stupid thing I said earlier, so I do still say things I shouldn't. But as an introvert, I tend to review everything. I don't just talk, right? My husband's an extrovert. He says all kinds of things all the time that I'm just like, what? You know, why did you say that? Our youngest son is an extrovert. And as a mother, I learned that, you know, you can never anticipate everything someone will say that they shouldn't, right? It's just not possible. Just like what I said to this gentleman earlier about the violin, you know, I could not read that in a book. Like, don't say that, you know, like you cannot anticipate everything. So it's easier sometimes to be an introvert because you have a little more of a filter. But mostly learn to control your words and actions and your thoughts will start to change. And the biggest thing that changes your thinking is relationships, getting to know people. 
having real relationships. You know, there's the old joke stereotype, you know, I have a black friend. I mean, you don't really have a black friend if they're not on your list of, you know, cell phone list, if they're not, you know, in your whatever short list of people you would call and tell them you had a grandchild or, you know, whatever. They're not really your friend if you don't have their phone number. That's one of the, seriously, this is one of the questions people have asked people, you know, if you say you have black friends or friends of color, do you have their phone number? If you don't have their phone number, they're not your friend. Like they're an acquaintance and you might speak to them at church or something. I did some research myself about churches that were multicultural. They're basically churches with significant numbers of black and white and the relationships between them and whether they were forming relationships with across race in the church. And so we can go to church together but never really get to know anybody, never get each other's phone numbers and that kind of thing. So that's a whole nother level and that's one of the things that will help. I said earlier that people can have different opinions about what's offensive and you can't just ask one person of color and then get you know the rules for everybody. This is my granddaughter and if you can't read it, I put it up on Instagram when she was little. It says curls makes girl hair. So this is right when her hair started to curl and it's super cute. And I put this picture up and I thought it was adorable because she's adorable. And I have a good friend who I know well enough that she can correct me if she thinks I'm out of line. And she personally, uh, privately, she was very, you know, diplomatic, privately messaged me and said, eh, mixed girl. She says, what do, my granddaughter's name's Ren, what are Ren's parents? What are Norton Anthony? Do they call her that? Do they use that word? And she talked to me about the history of that term and how that can be offensive. As it turns out, they do use that word. So on the one hand, if I'm around, my son-in-law is the person I'd be most concerned about. He's the black man who's, this is his daughter. And if he thinks it's offensive to call her mixed, I certainly don't want to do that. My other friend was offended. So I want to do, as I said earlier, the kind of the least common denominator. So, you know, I'm not going to use that term if that's going to offend other people. Um, it's funny because what we tend to do, and I've done it myself, is poll people. Like, how many people can we get to agree with us and tell us this isn't okay? And I might say, Fred, do you think it's offensive to say that? And, you know, and you'll hear people say, and you see this all the time in media, both, both public media, social media, well, my friend who's black said that it's okay. Well, that's that one person's opinion, right? So what we want to do is be as least offensive as possible and if somebody tells you that's offensive, as we said earlier, believe them, try to, try to not go there. There's a, a wonderful book called The Wolf Shall Dwell at the Lamb. And the author is a Native American. He's a pastor. It's a great book, and he's written several. And they're very usable for the church. And he talks about all kinds of cultural issues between the different races. He talks about the difference in how we see time. So the typical white person in this country, and it's even worse than some other cultures in the world like Switzerland, time, you know, you, you have to be on time. You're disrespectful if you're late. There's this whole idea that, you know, if you don't show up on time, you're being disrespectful to me. And it's the first time I've had someone really explain to me well why someone wouldn't think that. Like, you know, because that's the way I was raised. And I'm not always on time, but that's the way I was raised. That that's the expectation. And he talks in there about, and he talks about the Latinx culture and where, why would you think that I'm so important that it matters if I show up at the beginning? Like, why would I think so much of myself, like, oh, they can't start without me? You know, it's just a different, different way to look at things and a different way to look at time, not to mention the fact that just in general, we're obsessed with the clock here, right? So if you go to some other countries and some other cultures, they're just on a different uh, system of the day and, and how you measure things. So that's a cultural difference. One of the most interesting things he talks about in the book, he talks about having conferences and events where you had a mixture of races and you were trying to understand what the people of color in the room had to say. And when the conference was over, the white people would say, well, they never spoke up. They never talked. And the people of color said, they never asked. They never invited us. So the people of color had come into this space that they saw as a white space and that they needed permission and they needed someone to invite them to speak. And the white people, because we think we can talk wherever we go and we're used to just, you know, saying what we, what we think, 
thought they would just do that and didn't know they needed to be invited. So everybody goes home frustrated. You know, the white people frustrated that he didn't say anything. People of color frustrated they didn't get asked. So he has this suggestion for how to have a meeting in a group. So if, imagine if you're in a circle and the first person who speaks invites the next person to talk. He has a couple of points he makes about this. One is if you just go around the circle, like so the person on the left is going to talk next. When the person next to you is talking, you're thinking, okay, it's my turn almost. What am I going to do? You know, you're, you're distracted by that. If you don't know when, then hopefully you're listening. Oh, you still might be distracted. You're also giving power to everyone equally. So when it's my turn to talk, I get the power to invite Suji to talk. Well, then she has the power to invite Jeremy to talk. And Jeremy has the power to invite Topher to talk. So everybody's being treated the same. Everybody gets the opportunity to empower the next person. And I can almost just see that on, like, a young person's face, like how special they would feel, you know, if it was, a, especially if it was an intergenerational group, that they got to ask a grown-up, you know, to be the next person, and they got to have that kind of power. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, technique to use in a group of people. One of the other things I said earlier about doing your homework, expose yourself to other cultures. There's so many ways you can do this. Um, and it probably makes the most sense about where you live. So Cincinnati is almost exclusively white and African-American population. We're starting to have a little more variety, but that's kind of who we are. And so that's what our church has always been. That's what our neighborhood has always been. So that's been my personal experience. But I've been trying to stretch myself, you know, read other things. So I have just some suggestions on here. Movies. We can all go to movies, right? Um, I asked uh, Michael Trailer for some movie advice. He gave me like six, so there's lots of them, but I chose this one because I didn't have enough room. Fences. So if you haven't seen Fences, uh, interestingly, uh, my daughter Junior lives in the neighborhood where that was filmed. It's, it's a Pittsburgh, the, the author is from Pittsburgh, and so it's kind of cool to see that. The Farewell, I meant to ask Suji this ahead of time. I don't know how, if you, you haven't seen it yet. I was really impressed, and one of the cool things that goes on in that movie um, the premise is that the, they all go home to see, the, we'll call her the grandmother of the story because the, you're coming from the point of view of the granddaughter. So the one, she had two sons, and one moved to the States and one moved to Japan. And so even though they both left China, they are, have a very different experience and very different worldview because one has stayed in the eastern part of the world and one has moved to Western culture. And so this interesting conflict between how they all deal with each other, it's, it's really pretty interesting. It's very well done. At least, at least I really enjoyed it. And that's out right now. So you can go to theater and see that. And, and then I asked uh, Topher's wife, Vanelda, for an, a, a, an example of a Latinx movie. And she gave me Real Women Have Curves. And we also talked about Coco, which is, you know, very specifically Mexican. It's a cartoon. But things that we do that we start to see other cultures. And a lot of... Some of the movies to understand other cultures better are hard to watch, like painful to watch. Um, one of the movies that Michael and I talked about that I have seen is uh, For All the Colored Girls, which was originally a play on Broadway and they made it into a movie. And it's about the abuse of black women. And so that has the sex, the gender thing in it too. So watching movies, you know, it's, it's, it sounds kind of silly, but it is a way to start to get a window, especially if you think of that as what you're doing, you know, you're being entertained. But if you think of what are the differences, you know, does, is this how my family would respond? And again, not that it's a monoculture, like that's how every Chinese family acts or certainly not how a, every Asian family acts, but just to, to get a picture, it can be one of the ways to do that. Reading books by authors of color. Oh my gosh, you know, I didn't have time to, to make a long list for you, but even, again, fiction, you know, you get this other sense. And for so long, especially growing up, in my generation, we mostly read, you know, white authors, whether they're American or British or whatever. Didn't read a lot of authors of color. And now it's just still so many wonderful opportunities to read, you know, fantastic books by different folks and really get a little bit of a piece of what their culture is like. So that's one of the things you can do. Um, music and festivals. Now, I'm going to put this next thing up here. We have to avoid cultural appropriation, okay? So... We have this crazy problem, especially with, for example, hip hop, you know, where we've kind of, white folks have kind of taken that over and, you know, they dress a certain way and all that kind of thing. And, you know, we can have a whole argument about where, where the line is with that. But, you know, listen to other types of music, go to festivals. I just read a book, I need to think of the name of it uh, to recommend it, but it's a book about Native American culture. 
and it talked about powwows. And it was curious to me, I have some a uh, couple of great grandmothers that were in Cherokee, and it made me want to go to one. I'm like, is that okay? Like, would they feel like I'm invading their space? But evidently, no. They appreciate, and you know, obviously, you could act stupid there, <laughs> and that would be inappropriate. So this is where the lines are. But there are things you can attend, you know, in your city. A lot of cities have uh, Latino festivals and different kinds of festivals where you can get a better idea. So exposing yourself to other cultures. Obviously, there is a whole book list of books. I brought two with me. I'm going to put one up in a minute, but of just books you can read about race and understanding that better. But at the moment, I'm just talking about trying to learn a, bit, a little bit more about it. Okay, why is the slideshow not working? Hmm. Let's see if it goes backwards. Nope. Okay. Scott, we'll see if he can help. Okay, um, I can talk about these two books while he's look, looking at that. I started recently not buying so many books because, um, yeah, if you pastors understand how many books you can have after three decades of accumulating them. But I have also want to support people who I want to support, right? So I got to go to a lecture in Cincinnati by Jamar Tisby. Okay, thank you. You got it fixed. Um, his book's called The Color of Compromise, and he's a Christian. And so one of the cool things is it's, you know, one thing to read a book about racism and all that kind of thing, but when you read a book by a believer and they're talking about the church, it just gives you a little bit of a different idea. And so in The Color of Compromise, partly he's talking about money. He's talking about uh, complicity, uh, progress. It's, it's really good. I really enjoy what he had to say, and I'm like, I, I want to buy his book because I want to support him. And then I'm going to have a slide up with this on it later, but um, even Kendi just came out. There it is. To not be a racist, be an anti-racist. So you need to take a step beyond, like, people, like, protest. I'm not a racist. Well, to be an anti-racist means you're actively working to promote other things and to not be a racist. He also wrote Stamp from the Beginning. Stamp from the Beginning is a book that it's really a tome, and it's, it's a lot to chew on. But he gives all the history of how he got here and all the, the craziness that went on behind the scenes to teach what we've all imbibed without meaning to. We don't have to go back to that other slide, but I also um, suggested that you take yourself to places that maybe you're uncomfortable. I tell college students to, when you're at college, uh, so to back up a step, Junia's uh, graduate advisor was Michael Emerson, and Michael Emerson wrote the book Divided by Faith. And he had the opportunity once to speak at one of his son's colleges, and he told them, go to a, a black church while you're here. They're basically all white students. Go to a black church. You're in college. You know, this isn't your permanent church you're going to probably go to. You're probably just going to be here for a little while. Go to a black church. And what he has done, he's uh, someone who I admire greatly. He's one of those people that you meet someone, you love their writing, and you find out they're just an amazing human being, and you just like them all the more. He, for the last decades of his life will wherever he's living he'll find a black church and he'll be part of that and he's someone with you know he's a PhD and he's all this influence he just helps he doesn't try to you know become the answer man he doesn't try to take over the pastor's job he just comes alongside and is just as supportive as he can be so most of you here a lot of you here maybe all of you are either pastors or very involved in your local church so I'm not trying to tell you <laughs> to leave your local church if your church is white okay but when you go on vacation, that's one of the things I do. You know, I've had sabbaticals where I've had the opportunity to visit other churches. Some churches have other services during the week you could attend. Some of you who are pastors, sometimes, you know, you can do, like, um, joint services or swap days or whatever. So that's one way. But also, find places that are uh, different in cultural ways that you can visit. One of the times that Junie and I were in New York City, we wanted to go see this special exhibit in Harlem. And we got on the bus, and we rode the bus to this place right in the middle of Harlem. And just riding the bus was absolutely fascinating. Because we got on the bus probably somewhere in Manhattan, I don't really, really remember. Probably a pretty mixed crowd. And then the bus continued. And we were the only white people left on the bus, right? Because nobody else was going to Harlem that day except us that was white. And so that's an experience to start with, right? Just to be on the bus and then to get off and go see this exhibit that was a really, really cool uh, thing that we could see there. 
So sometimes, you know, put yourself in those situations, especially if you never have. And, you know, as females, we always want to be concerned about, you know, if it's nighttime, you know, whatever, that we're doing things that are smart, so obviously be careful. But don't assume, just again, because a neighborhood isn't white, that doesn't mean it's not safe, okay? So I don't want to sound like that's what I'm saying, but find places that are different from your experience that you can spend some time in and have that, that different experience. All right, I'm going to stop right there and see if you have questions you'd like to ask from, we've, you've had, you know, kind of a water hose of stuff. I can't necessarily answer questions that Junia might have brought up, but things that you're, you're struggling with right now that you would like to process. Right. Okay, so, so Daryl's question is, do we have a new word for race and that he doesn't like to fill out forms where he has to check his race? So I don't think we do yet. That might be something to work on. I think one of the things we need to do is learn to use it in a, in a positive way. Just like anything else, you can redeem it. You can't redeem some words, they're just slurs, but it doesn't need to be what it's been turned into. One of the things that honestly sounds like being colorblind is when people say, this is not what you're saying, but I've heard people say, there's no such thing as race, we're all the human race. Eh. You know, again, that's like being colorblind. Like, yes, we're all the human race. Yes, we all want to be treated the same. But the truth is, you are a white man, and so you need to check your box. Because you just have to own that and be who you are, which is a white man who's compassionate, kind, and cares about these things. So it's a weird place to be because <laughs> my kids grew up, especially my girls, because I think for whatever reason, they were way more sensitive about, you know, they grew up in a neighborhood that was half black, half white, went to schools like that. They were way more conscious about it. They really didn't want to be white people because, yeah, the, the reputation that that had. And there's a couple of funny stories about that. One, um, I, I forgot your name. Tell me again. Maybell. Maybell. Um, she was talking about colors and, and how we use the word colored. This is a kind of a reverse story. Our church is in a neighborhood that's half black, half white. The neighborhood next to us is a housing project that when my kids were young, it's, it's d diversified a little bit now, but it was almost all black, so 90-something percent African American. And... There were a few white people that had moved in on the street where a couple of the preschoolers lived that my daughter, Junie, was teaching. So she's teaching these preschoolers. She sees them every week. She's a kid magnet. Kids absolutely adore her, okay? So they were having a conversation between them about those white people. So you were saying earlier, Fred, the blacks, and this was those white people. And so obviously there was something they'd been hearing at home that was negative about those white people. And so they had their little conversation, and after they were done, Junia looked at them, and she said, well, what color do you think I am? And they look at each other, and they tried to decide if she was orange or purple, and decided on purple. At that age, they couldn't process the fact that their family were saying negative things about those white people, but they knew Junia, and Junia couldn't be that, because she wasn't one of those people, so she must not be white, okay? That's one story. Um, my older daughter, Nora, I thought about trying to, trying to get this, but if you Google, so you can Google Junia Howell and you will get my daughter. She's the only person out there on the, me, on the internet with that particular name and you'll just get pages, you'll get her website. If you wanna look up, read her articles, go for it. My daughter, Nora, and uh, she's married now, but still on, on the internet, it's still Nora Howell, has a page of her art. And she did a video where she put um, marshmallow cream on her face. And she did like this slow motion capture thing where she's trying to take the marshmallow off. 
And the point of her story is she was like trying to take off her whiteness. And when she first went to do her master's degree in Baltimore, where pretty much all the students were African American, and she was trying to do community art with them, you know, just struggling with this whole idea of, you know, I wish I wasn't white, you know, but we are. One more story about that. Nora did a different art exhibit where when you walked into the, to the room, it was like an interactive thing, you got to pick your, your coffee drink. And it was uh, from one to six, it was a color-coded thing. So one was milk, and six was just plain old black coffee. And so most people, you know, most people didn't pick one, most people didn't pick six. It was like two to five, you know. So this young woman comes in, uh, probably in her 20s, maybe 30, and I was the one taking the order, so to speak. And we were actually making these drinks. We were actually mixing them up. We had a, a woman that was a barista, and we were actually mixing them up, and then she had some art around the room to look at. So it was this whole interactive thing. And she points at, I don't know, maybe five. And I'm just like, you are not a five. And this goes back to this whole idea of that for whatever her background was, she had this strong identity with the black community. It reminds you of the whole story about the NAACP woman who classed herself off as black, which is kind of crazy. But we still see you as white, and you still walk through the world as a white person. So it doesn't matter, you know, what our background is. We still are who we are when we walk around, and we can't really change that. So it was a very long answer to your question. Did you have a follow-up? Okay, so just to summarize, Daryl's saying, you know, that, that there's a negativity to white in terms of as opposed to black. So like the superiority, like a gradation thing. That's true. Here's the other side of it. There's always another side, right? Again, owning our whiteness. And it's funny because a lot of black children are taught not to use that word. Like white. Like that's offensive. Like I, I'll have kids sometimes, like they're not, they're not sure. And one of the things Nora was teaching her students was, like, you can use that word. It's okay. And so part of it is walking into the, to the ownership of those things. Um, and then the whole thing really with what do we call everybody, right? Because is it black? Is it African-American? You know, now it's Latinx. To, so you have the O's and the A's and which gender are you talking about? And there's so many, so many things about the evolution of language. And so I hope, it, I hope we get somewhere. But I think the important thing really is to be genuine as to who we are and, and own who we are. Somebody else over there? Yes. Yeah, so to summarize that, do we give up the term Christian or do we reclaim it? And I think it's even more true the term evangelical, right? So that's the Trump era, you know, that has been drugged through the mud in so many ways, depending on your opinion about, you know, all those issues. And I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying it's just become a real problem. That are we going to use that word or not? And a lot of people are like, no. And it's interesting. I saw a post where someone was... The title of it was how to make sure your church isn't progressive. Like, that's a bad thing. And one of them was because it's involved in social justice. Like, that's a bad thing, right? If you haven't read Divided by Faith, I always recommend that book. Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson, Christian Smith. If you haven't read it, it's, it's the primer on the church and race. 
And it's an older book, but nothing has really come along to replace the reality of it because they're sociologists, they did their research, and to summarize the premise, the thesis of the book is that white Christians think the point of church is to evangelize people, and black Christians think it's still important to do justice. They don't throw it, they don't not do evangelism. They think you can do two things at once. You can walk and chew gum, you know, you can love God and you can care about justice issues. So that's a, a very general thing, but that was what they found in their research. And so even this week, I think it was last week, maybe, when that someone posted that article and I was kind of pushing back, you know, you can still do social justice. And somebody's like, well, but then there's the gospel. It's not an either or, you know. And Jesus himself, remember him saying, you know, don't send someone away hungry. Don't send them away thirsty. You know, how are you going to lead them to Christ when they're a mess? And what evangelicals have traditionally, what white evangelicals have traditionally done is made it an individual thing that we're helping this hurting person, but they haven't worked on the systemic things, and as you just saw Junia present, the systemic things, we're never going to fix the problem if we don't work in the systemic things. So we have to care about more than just the individual person. We need to break things down. Something somebody said today, um, talked. I think it must have been Dan, talked about making people welcome at church. And this is really, really hard to do. If you're a white church and you've never had a person of color in your door and they walk in, man, that's rough. You know, because they're going to look around and see they're the only one. So they're instantly going to feel uncomfortable. But it does matter how you behave. I had a woman tell me a story that she was visiting a church. She's an African-American woman. And the church had, I guess, some immigrant people, I, I think probably from Africa. She's African-American. And first of all, he wanted her to sit with them because she must know them, right? Because she's black, right? And all black people know each other. And it was a really uncomfortable part of the church where, yeah, <laughs> just to get that straight. Thank you, Fred. So, you know, they really tried to make her sit over there. And, you know, we do these weird things because they thought they were doing her a favor, I think, in their mind. Like, oh, you probably know them, which she was just really frustrated. And obviously, she's not going to come back there. Um, there are things... Right, yeah, and and it's interesting. The worship team is planning to enjoy us singing in other languages while we're here. And Suji asked me, you know, what was our goal? Do we have real diversity? Are we just trying to push people? You know, and I'm like, yes, 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 yes. You know, because one of the the principles really of having a multicultural church is that everybody in the church should have some time in the service where they feel comfortable, and that means that. There's going to be time they don't feel comfortable, right? So if, if we need to sing in Swahili part of the time because we have a Swahili family, then part of the time, you know, the English speakers are going to be lost. But then most of the time, the, English, the Swahili speakers are lost. So we can take turns. You know, we can, we can do what we need to do to make them feel comfortable. So sometimes we have to stretch beyond. And you'll see churches who, like, hire a staff person of color. They don't even have youth yet that are of color, but they know they're out there. And so they'll hire that person. And that's very visionary. You know, that's a great way to do it. But until you kind of get that critical mass, it's really, really hard. And there's no magic, you know, formula for that. But the, the more effort you make. I, a really funny story. There's a, a Presbyterian church in my city, and it had been white. And that neighborhood had started. It's a very nice kind of upper middle class neighborhood. And the neighborhood started to integrate. And they had actually had the conversation in the board about, well, what are we going to do if some of the, they were all black people, black people come to church. And they said, well, we'll, we'll, welcome, we'll welcome them. So this woman that I know, I was uh, doing part of her funeral, and her son told the story that one Sunday they were late. And she was not going to go late to her church downtown. She was not going to walk in late. So they went to the closest church, which was this white church. And they walked in and People actually made them feel welcome, which is really, really impressive, okay? And they stayed. And then that became a significantly integrated church over the years. So this woman was like the first person in her family. And then other people came and other people came. And they did a really good job. You know, I'm sure they made some stupid mistakes along the way. But they were a welcoming presence even that very first time. So, you know, you have to be. And everybody thinks we would do that. But that's where you just have to evaluate, you know, and then. And listen to feedback you get. And if somebody comes and you never see them again, if you have any way to ask, you know, try to find out, you know, 
what did we do? You know, what, what, well, how did we mess up and see if we can fix it? Is there other? Yes. Right. Right. Yes. This is normal, yeah. Yeah, so noticing our, our spaces and being aware. Right. Right, you can be the one that speaks up. And one of the things I've noticed, um, so when my oldest daughter, she went to Wheaton, and that she had never been to, in such a white space. Yeah, wow, I was right. And a month in, she called me up, and she's kind of freaking out, you know. And, and the, the hard thing about being a white person in a white space, and that's not comfortable for you, is no one else knows that, you know, because you look like all the other white people, and you're not walking around with a sign in your head that says, I'm an ally or, you know, whatever. So you have to figure out how to behave in that space in a way that other people start to understand. And what I've personally learned through the years is just, it's just how you treat people, right? It's just looking in the white space and noticing, oh, there's someone of color. I just want to make sure they're comfortable. Now, again, you have to be careful how you do that because they can be like, I don't need you. <laughs> you know, like just because, just because I'm only a black person in the room doesn't mean you have to sit next to me, you know, whatever. So you can read clues. But a lot of times people just feel welcome that somebody sat down next to them and they're not sitting by themselves, right? So that's an interesting thing. Topher was talking about how in his Latina church, Latinx church, you know, people are apologizing when they have bad white people stories. So I'm in this Facebook group. And um, I can't even remember who invited me to be in there, but it's, it's basically for people of color and allies, okay? So I accepted the invitation, and my main goal all the time is to keep my mouth shut. And sometimes when someone tells a terrible white people story, it just depends on what it is. Most of the time I just don't comment or I'll put a, you know, sad face or a mad face or whatever. Sometimes I will apologize. I mean, in a good way. I'll just say, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I won't apologize for that person because I can't do that. But I'll, I'll just say, that's terrible. I'm really sorry that happened to you. But what I never do is try to defend them. I never try to defend them. I never say, not all white people are like that. Or I would never do that. Or I never. I just keep my mouth shut. I try to, <laughs> yes, right, exactly. And I should be kicked out of the group. I just try to stay under the radar. But it's fascinating, you know, when you have the privilege when someone trusts you, and even though this is just Facebook, trusts you to, to hear their stories. 
um, it's it's so insane. And the you know the more reading you do, the more exposure you get to that. An another interesting personal story. My husband uh, has played ball with these older guys forever, and the, uh, our sons and some of the other men's sons started playing as they grew up. So there was one time when my husband couldn't go, and my son drove to the group by himself. So now they're like college age, okay, so just to give you a point of reference. He goes there by himself, plays ball. It's in a, a kind of wealthy Jewish neighborhood in our city. So this other young man from another family, this kid, his, his, he's a black kid, right? His family is more well-off than we are. They live in a way better neighborhood. I mean, they're just, you know, in terms of economic privilege, they're just way beyond where we are. He drives up in another van, another family van. The police follow him, follow him in the neighborhood and ask him what he's doing there. Then ask my son what he's doing there. They're the same age, they went to the same school, one's black and one's white, and that's what happens. So, you know, just story after story. Yeah. A friend who, who texted several of us to say, please pray, my son didn't come home last night. I know that the, um, the law was involved in this. Um, I responded to her as having also had a son who was wayward and had similar kinds of situations. She was in my heart all day. But what I said to her is, I did never had to worry about how the color of my son's skin might impact what the result of how he was treated. And I was able to give that example within the community in a way that people could finally say, because then I said, this is what white privilege is all about. And we have to understand the lens that we view the world through because we could be a stronger ally by joining with others while we're aware of the color of our skin and our privilege. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting how we, how we cope with those situations and, and it really, it does impact other people, how we respond and the kind of empathy we show without, the interesting thing about when, when people say, I'm not privileged and people, you know, like, I grew up poor. We were on, you know, they have all these stories about how poor they were. But were you poor because you were a person of color? No. And so that's the difference. And you saw the dramatic statistics that Junia showed you that show that, of course, there's poor people. And, of course, there's unemployed white people. Of course, there's poor white people. There's more poor statistics, or proportionally, there's more poor white people, more poor black people. But proportionally, that's not true. And so... You know, there are plenty of, of white people that can't find work, but are they not being employed because they won't be hired because of the color of their skin? No. You know, that's not what's going on. So that's the difference, and we have to push back when people, people say things like that. It's also interesting, and this kind of goes back to the whole, a uh, little bit more into the capitalism, socialism, all that kind of thing, when people complain about, you know, uh, welfare and all those kind of things. But, you know, how do we tax right now? It's the rich are the ones getting all the, all the welfare, so to speak, you know, so we, we kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth. It depends on what it is. I had someone say somewhere along the way that no one likes free stuff better than rich people. And then I saw later some joke about the Oscars, you know, they give them those really, really nice swag bags and they just go crazy over them, you know, all these little treats they get. And these are, you know, so, such rich people, the really high end of the rich people. So we tend to, you know, have all these assuasions. There's a huge intersection between race and poverty, and there's a huge intersection between uh, race, poverty, and gender. There's a huge intersection between race, poverty, gender, and sexual orientation. I mean, all those things, you know, intertwine with one another in crazy ways and cause, you know, the, the more of those boxes you have to check, then the 
the more likely you are to be poor, the more likely you are to not get a job, the more likely you are, you know, A, B, and C. So that stuff all kind of runs together. Yes. I find the conversation about the terminology of white kind of fascinating as I'm listening to it. And the reason why I find it kind of fascinating is because um, it's, it, it is very likely that it's a little bit easier for those of you who are white to figure out um, what part of Europe you're probably from. Um, my great grandfather was an orphan who traveled from New Jersey to DC with a priest who went to work at, a white priest who went to work at Georgetown University. We had no idea anything about his background. Um, my grandmother, uh, her maiden name is Carpenter, and we are able to trace the Carpenters back to a plantation in Culpeper, Virginia. Um, that's as far back as I can go. So I can't do nothing but black. <laughs> or I can take African American, but as y'all showed, as, as we saw on the map, and June didn't point that out, Africa's a pretty big place. Um, so so, so um, the, the, I think the only time it even the, the, the becomes problematic is when it's, it's looked at in the way that the term is used, and, I, and you actually uh, I had mentioned this, the way that's kind of used as sort of this way to just distinguish it from everybody else and then you have sort of these groups that call themselves white nationalists when it's like uh, well white's not a nation <laughs> and so that really doesn't you know you, you so it's it's sort of you know that's so I find it sort of like I said interesting I don't have a problem with the term white but or or black or I mean, my wife has the hardest time because she's black, white, Indian, like, or native, rather. Um, so she always has a hard time picking those things. But it's when we use those terms to keep separate, you know, that, well, I, I'm different than you. So, like, I'm white, you're black. So, but I, I'm white. It's, there's no getting away from this pale face. Um, some of you saw my school picture from 30 years ago. This is the same face. Um, but it, it's when we use those terms. To too much of the, face of the, the, the glasses were way, way too much, and the hair swooping down covered the rest. Um, but when we use those terms to just keep us separate, well, I, I go to a white church or I go to a black church, then that's when it becomes problematic that we employ those terms. But just the terms themselves, I'm white. It's just what I am. Right. You do. You are a multicultural church. It's interesting. Yeah. It's funny. Um, I was calling my church a biracial church because that's what it, it really is, you know. And then people are that that sounds really weird. So there's again, language can can really can really trip us up. I want to say one thing about black churches because sometimes some white folks are like, well, how is it that they get to have black churches, and that's okay, but it's not okay if we have white churches, just like the weird things people say about why don't we have white history month when every month is white history month, but um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the books that uh, Julia Sittig is reading right now, she shows before we left, is a, a great book called Why Are the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And it's a little bit older book, but it's still great, Beverly Tatum. When my kids went from their uh, elementary school, which was half white, half black, to their junior high, which was still the same way, and they had been so nicely integrated in their friend groups and really never talked about it. Um, I remember one of my favorite stories when Nora was little, uh, she had two best friends in school, and one was a white Jewish girl and one was an African American girl. And one time she told me she was more like, she said, you know, I don't remember their names right now, but I'm more like, Susie or whatever, and I said, why is that? You know, and she felt more like the African-American girl because just her values, her kinds of things she liked or whatever, she identified more with her. So she did not see color. There's a, a part of which kids don't. As Junie was explaining to someone earlier, kids learn it pretty quickly, though, 
not only what the colors are, but what groups they're in, just like they learn if they're in the good reading group or not, right? You can, you can call it the blue group, but they know they're, whether they're in the good reading group or not. So the kids grew up in elementary school, it seems like they didn't notice, and then all of a sudden in junior high, they start this regrouping thing. And I was distressed by it, you know, because it's all new to me, both as a parent and as a person trying to understand race better, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago, whatever that was. But there's a sense of identity that happens when you're a teenager, right? There's a sense of trying to understand who you are in every way, you know, your sexuality, your gender, uh, everything. And so the kids were, were regrouping because they needed to have a safe space. And one of the things that most African Americans have to do is live in a white world at work, at school, you know, depending on their situation, and then to have a safe place on Sunday is important. And so there's a sense in which we'll always have black churches. And the other problem is not a whole lot of white folks want to go there. So we, we white pastors are trying to get our churches to be more integrated. And there are, I know personally, black pastors who wish their church was more integrated. But how do you get a bunch of white folks to come and integrate your church? You know, they're not out looking to do that. And so, again, I'm not trying to tell you to leave your churches because I don't want to get in trouble with your pastors. But it's an interesting thing to think about, right, that we don't, in, in, we don't tend to do that. You know, we don't tend to want to make that move as the white people. And the other thing, I'm really glad I remember this because it's one of the most important things. I should have said it right away. It's not enough to welcome people if we still expect them to assimilate. If we're trying to have a diverse church that's really just a white church with some color in it and everybody's still singing the same songs and doing the same things and blah 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 doing all the same traditions then we've just squeezed them into our white space and that's not helpful so kind of what I said earlier but and it's not just about language it's not just about music it's about lots of stuff so allowing other traditions to be part of who you are allowing other people to be in charge allowing you know just all kinds of dynamics uh, I mentioned how crazy the history of this church is and, you know, the, the pastors they've had and how it, it's really unusual to be a white male pastor here. And so Scott was telling me, can I tell him the story you told me? Is that okay? You, okay. <laughs> He's like, what story are you talking about? He was talking about when he first started as the head pastor after the trailers left and one of his African-American board members said, you realize you're the only white person on this board and male too, white male on this board. You know, you need to think about how you use that, you know, and that's really important, and, and you're the pastor, so you have the authority of the pastor, and then you have the authority of being a white man, then you need to really steward that carefully, you know, and how you respond to people, so, so it's just really important that, you know, we keep our radar on as white folks to, you know, how are we expecting someone else to accommodate us, and how are we expecting them to act differently because we're around, so, do you have any, okay, just wrap up, Susie. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, as you were talking about, you know, music and language and how we, we need to be embracing and welcoming people. Um, and I just want to celebrate that at General Conference, we were able to be led in worship, you know, with different styles of music and different languages by predominantly people of color. And for us to realize that for a long time in most of our churches, it has not been that way. Even though there's neighborhoods that we're surrounded with, that have diversity, that listen to different types of styles of music. And so, you know, as you've been talking about welcoming people in and making sure that, you know, we're, we are seeing that in the music we're choosing or in the graphics we're putting up on the slides, that if we're continuing to perpetuate a very Eurocentric or Anglo or Christian contemporary, whatever those things are, that that's a very, very narrow perspective. Yes, it's one um, facet of who God is, but God is multifaceted, so how can we integrate all those other values and music styles and worship styles and languages and all of those things that are going to engage and resonate with people that worship very differently from us? And so I, I really believe that, you know, music has the power to bring people together. The other thing is food. We've talked about that, how amazing food is when you break bread. Um, with people from different cultures and backgrounds. But man, music 
just one of those things, you know, even if, it, you know, and that was, you know, as we were, the worship team was curating these songs, that was our question was, like, okay, are we doing this because we think it's cool or because there are going to be people there that speak Spanish? I'm Korean, so should I sing a song in Korean instead of Spanish? And so, you know, just kind of like thinking through the values of why are we doing what we're doing, but to know that we're willing to experiment and we're willing to make mistakes along the way because at least we tried instead of doing what's safe and what's comfortable and what the top 10 list is um, that's happening. So. Dorcas, did you have something? Yeah, go, go ahead and come up and use the mic. Since you're that far, we'll just have you come to us. Thank you so much. It just makes it a little easier for everybody. I wasn't in here for the whole thing, but I just wanted to respond to something that you said about us as white folks identifying as white. You're Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, all I wanted to say is I think you're right. Like, there is no such thing as white. And um, I heard a really great suggestion from Lisa Sharon Harper on an interview she did. Something that we can do, the term white was used, has been used on the census throughout our American history all the way to the back, to the beginning, um, in part to conglomerate power among those of us with lighter skin. And she says, you know, resist that. Call yourself what you are. I did my DNA test. I am Northwestern European, you know, 95%. Um, so why don't I not call myself that, a European American? Um, so when I fill out forms now, I, tr I sort of resist that white um, category. Like, it doesn't exist. Why do I check that box? So. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a difference too between. Yes. I do. I, I think there's a difference too between using that terminology when you're talking to people and checking the box on the census. Seriously, do the census the way, in, I don't know, whatever, whatever they expect you to do because we need to know what's really true. And if a bunch of white people put other, then it makes it look like there's not as many white people. And that's a false interpretation. And the people like my daughter who study statistics and try to understand trends are going to be confused. And it's funny because you're going to hear some stats tonight about the BOA. And we were trying to identify the race of everyone on the current BOA. And Dorcas asked me about how Conklin I've always thought of how Conklin is a white guy. And so I asked Denny, his friend, because I don't know how well enough to ask that question. You really should always ask the real person, but I don't know him very well. And I said, Denny, is he white? You know, we're trying to figure this out. And he's like, well, he's half Arminian. So then I asked my daughter, the expert on all this stuff, well, okay, well, what are Arminians? You know, if he's half Arminian, because then we have this whole conversation, if you're half black, what are you, blah, blah, blah. Well, Arminians were always considered, quote, white until 9-11. So isn't that interesting? And they still are on the census. They would be white on the census. So for statistical purposes, whatever, how Conklin considers himself, sorry to talk about him in his absence. I apologize for that. He is white on the census. <laughs> and the other problem is, when I did the 2011 statistics, I assumed he was white, right or wrong. So I didn't want to change his race so that it looked like we gained one more person of color when we had the same guy on this. I mean, he's still there. So, so he's still white in my numbers. Um, but it is important, I think, to, to own who we are. I wanted to, uh, let's see, I wanted to see what G said. I had one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, the other difference I mentioned earlier between white and black churches is the willingness to uh, engage in social justice issues. And so one of the things that makes you a healthy multicultural church or diverse church is if you will do that. And what happens is we have a lot of big churches. For example, in our city, we have a big church. Every city has a big church that just kind of swallows up everybody, right? The big mega church that has the best show, they have the best preaching. And so they end up with people of color, right? Because it's a great church that everybody thinks is really fun. And so this particular church has one particular service that they basically have all decided to go to because they're, you know, critical mass. And so in that service, it's really, really well balanced. 
but they don't talk about these things. And they, it's interesting because the black people that go there, a couple of things happen. They either go and they stay for a while and they still like it, or they go and stay for a while and they get frustrated and they, they leave because they're like, you know, why aren't we talking about the, the shooting that just happened? And so they were, they were kind of cruising along on that mode of not dealing with these issues. And then we had a, a national incident that made the news where we had a black man shot by a police officer on our campus and totally inappropriate, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden they had to have a conversation. So it's interesting how sometimes you get your hand gets forced. But I want to encourage you, if you have any diversity in your church, you can't not talk about stuff. You can't just ignore that and act like, you know, everything's 